Well, thanks y'all for coming out to do database stuff with us today. So I'm gonna be talking about Fireproof, which this is the official launch. If there's official launch of Fireproof, it's right now and I can prove it because I have this super hot, hot sauce that all the Europeans are gonna start sweating when they eat. And yeah, I got into um, this maybe 14, 15 years ago, building peer-to-peer -peer data databases with Apache CouchDB and have been super excited about the space since then and kind of sitting back and letting the infrastructure create new opportunities to build cool databases. Uh, there, wasn't, um, there wasn't a way to build a database cooler than Apache CouchDB until now. And <laughs> so um, with the advent of Prolly Trees, well, we were able to do stuff on the immutable, you know, deterministic data backend that you know, we wouldn't, weren't able to do before. So Fireproof takes advantage of Prolly Trees and uh, it's been really like enlightening to hear the other discussions today from you know, folks who are deep in the database engineering side of it because I know, I mean, like I knew there was a lot that I was just touching the tip of the iceberg as far as my understanding of the data structures. So as far as the value that um, I'm trying to bring to the table in this community, it's how can we package this stuff to be so easy to use? Uh, there's a lot of power in Web3 and almost all of it has gone toward like, let's do something so totally super new that we never could have done before. And so um, that's great. And uh, my instinct is to take that, those capabilities and say, let's take that thing that everybody wants to do and just make it so easy that they can't believe it got this easy. So that's what the goal with Fireproof is, is build a database that React developers can drop in the page and have interactive application features and then get all the data integrity and replication capabilities that you, know, you normally need a backend database to handle. So we talk about you know, IPFS and peer-to-peer -peer means uh, the data can be anywhere. You can ask the network for the data. The, the database is the network. And if that's all true, then the place that you want your operations to start is as close to that user as possible. So in the browser um, or you know, in the mobile device. So that's what Fireproof is about. Um, and uh, you know, the big goal here being to uh, make it just easier than, uh, you know, whatever, what, what was the previous easiest database? Like whatever it was, it was like 10 times harder uh, to use. So that's the idea here. Um, and, uh, and then there's a bunch of stuff that we get because of being part of this community and using these data structures that is like more, you know, more serious than the previous easiest to use database, right? Um, so we can, with Merkle proofs, we can do things like data provenance for AI API calls. Um, anything that you see signed, you drop in there, you could sign Merkle proofs, you can put Merkle proofs on the blockchain and um, those are all use cases we were talking about in the last couple hours. So I feel like that, um, you know, sitting in this space in the, in the engineering trade-offs um, by being on the browser, but using Merkle proofs and using, you know, IPFS and Web3 storage for replication uh, allows us to make a database that is, um, that doesn't give away any seriousness by being so easy to use and so close to the end user. Um, which, you know, with my experience in Couch, um, you can do that, but we had to work a lot harder, I think, than Fireproof has to work in order to make the database useful for enterprise contexts. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna get into the actual, how it works by diving through the Miro. And so we're gonna talk about document lookup and the event feed and how the indexes are built. So that's all the application layer data management stuff. And then we'll talk about the infrastructure side of it. So how transactions work, how replication works, how encryption works and how sync works. And about 50% mm, of this stuff isn't written yet, but um, you know, the whole thing is discovered, not invented. So it's not like there's a whole bunch of other ways it could go. Um, so there's two main data structures in Fireproof. Um, 
we just heard all about prolly trees. So that's what's going on over here. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but we also use a uh, Merkle CRDT clock. And that is a lot like the data structures that we heard about from Aaron's talk at the beginning. Um, so what, uh, what the clock does, and thanks Alan Shaw, who's gonna be giving a detailed talk on this clock library in this room in the afternoon, um, is it allows you to have update histories that diverge and merge and then to ask questions of that update history in an efficient way. So the way that we use this is uh, every new update is based on a previous update. So when you, when you write into the clock, um, you know, your event is always appended to the clock's current. But uh, when you come back to the clock, you can have it give you everything since like say this update. Um, so if you were here, what would you need to sync to get everything you didn't already have before? Well, it would include this, um, you know, as well as everything since then. Um, so being able to pull those, those nodes out of the data structure and play them forward is one of the things the clock offers. And we leverage that um, not just for like the update cycle, but also to power the indexes. Because when you go to query an index, like you're not going to want to update the indexes on write, because as we saw, probably trees are going to be expensive to churn every single time there's a little change. So instead, we query the index on read, and that gives us natural batching, all the updates that happened since the last time, then get ingested at once into the index. Uh, but that means we need to go to the clock and say, what's that batch look like? And so that's what this is. Um, we'll go you know, from the last time the index was updated and then pull in all the relevant events and play them um, into the index again before we query. So what is hung off of each of these nodes um, is a version of one of these. Um, and uh, this is the probably tree JavaScript implementation that Michael Rogers wrote um, that is part of the same spec as the Go one uh, that we were just hearing about. So it's uh, going to, I mean, I think it may be diverging from the spec a little bit, which means we're innovating and now it's time to go push those changes back up. But uh, because of the way these probably trees work, if I were to put a change in here, you know, it's only going to change these nodes. Um, and so the operations are relatively lightweight, which means that although we have a version of the tree hanging off of each one of these events, the delta, the difference between what's going on in one of these events is pretty small. So it's not like we're duplicating the tree over and over again. Um, this essentially means that we couldn't have built this at all without probably trees. If you tried to build this without probably trees, you'd get huge right amplification with you know just a ton of disk work for every little thing you did. Um, but instead, almost all the writes resolve to stuff that's already been written. And so it makes it um, efficient on the back end to, to work with these kind of things. So yeah, that's, um, oh, that's how the storage works. Um, and uh, a little bit of how the event feed works. Um, I'll talk about you know, how the indexes are built. It's, a, it's like an Apache CouchDB style index. So you, get, you write a JavaScript function and you say, I want to index you know, anything that has a title. I want to index it by title. And now you can browse all the blog posts alphabetically. Um, so the indexes are also built out of this same data structure, um, which was is a choice that I didn't have to make, right? Like it, it, the core data structure needs to be a probably tree, um, and it needs to be working with this clock. But the derived indexes, you could just say, "Hey, I'm going to keep those only in the browser and have them be raw index DB." You might get like a small performance gain by doing that, even. Um, but the reason to have the indexes as well play in the probably tree content address game is that when you issue a query into the index, you know, um, it's going to hop down the nodes until it finds the range it's working on. And 
what I can do when I give you those results and, and what Fireproof does and, and where the name Proof comes from is it includes all those CIDs in the result set and you can use that for all kinds of stuff. Um, maybe the most straightforward is just uh, an accelerator. You know, um, you know, perhaps you have a big data set and a, and a client wants to query it, so they send the query over and, oh, these are the blocks the client needs to have in order to traverse into the tree, um, even the big tree, and not miss anything. So then you can ship all those blocks over you know, like a graph sync style uh, operation, and the client is able to operate seamlessly on the big data set without having to replicate it in advance. That's um, most of what there is for the front end. There's also, I suppose, the same way that the indexes know to bring themselves up to date by consuming all the changes that are relevant since the last time they were updated. There's public APIs, so you can hang your own indexer off of that um, and hydrate a full text index from your document set or um, a machine learning model or anything that needs to play causally through the data and be able to pause and restart and pick up again, um, you know, or pick up new changes after they've been applied. So the same feed, which, um, you know, in, in that case, allows you to incrementally index stuff and is, you know, kind of a database -y feature, is also a very, like, it's probably the priority zero most important feature, aside from being able to put and get data um, for React developers, because once you have this um, time to refresh function, and here's what you need to refresh with, now you can provide React developers with that auto refresh that repaints the page so when you're collaborating with other users, if database changes come in, the page will repaint automatically. Or if you um, don't want to have to thread all those data changes and know what to um, refresh as a developer when you make a change, um, you, know, you can put listeners into your app listening for specific events in the database, make changes in the database, and have the database dispatch, dispatch those events to your UI, which most React apps end up doing that anyway, but without the benefit of the database, right? They have to like do all this data flow just to get the events to refresh in the UI. And if they were to just put that through the database on the way, then they get both jobs done at once. So it makes, a, it makes for a simpler, faster development. So when we get into the storage engine side of it now, um, this is the part that is less visible to, you know, the functional requirements and more uh, about what you can do with it. Everything that the database does writes to an in-memory block store, which is just a JavaScript map of blocks um, from CID to block. And that at the end of an operation, you're going to have updated a handful of blocks. So. Um, your per operation block store might only have like six blocks in it that you just wrote. Um, so what we'll do is we take those blocks and we wrap them in a car file and this gets us like entry into all the new transport stuff that's coming online with Web3 storage and Saturn because um, car files are um, they're just a bag of blocks. It's like a it's like a tar or a zip, but for IPFS blocks. And by putting those at our transaction boundary, we get all kinds of neat stuff, right? Like it doesn't have to be at our transaction boundary. Um, and there's other times we might repack it into other sizes. But if my car files are coming off this, um, you know, let's say you've got an active database, now you just have a queue of car files, one per transaction coming off of it. And I can, um, it's more, I don't do this, but I could, and it works, upload those car files to Web3 storage as they happen. Um, and there's certain use cases where you'd want your data to be in the clear and for that to be your replication strategy. Uh, when you do it that way, you can just delete your local index DB, and as long as you have the CID of the root of your proly tree, then the app works just fine, even if a little bit slow. So, um, it is kind of nice to replicate in the clear like that, and we'll keep that an option for databases with encryption de disabled, but encryption is enabled by default, and so that kind of replication doesn't work with encrypted data. You have to think about it a little bit differently. 
Um, luckily, when you replicate encrypted data, I think it's faster um, because you're pulling down car files instead of blocks. Um, so uh, to talk a little bit about how it works in the encrypted case, what we do is between um, the clear blocks that were written to the in-memory store and the car file, we encrypt the blocks with a symmetric key. And so the symmetric key, um, it's, it's not like we're doing some kind of fancy public key thing there. We're not doing key management. Um, we're just making it so that the blocks that go in that car file and gets into Web3 storage aren't readable by anybody who happens by. And so uh, you have now, um, as part of the local data that you need, um, the head that it takes to decode the proly tree, um, not only do you need the CID of that root, but you also need the decryption key. So now you've got a tuple of, of kind of um, boot up information that you need to read the tree. But uh, it also means that what you're replicating uh, up to the cloud is going to be something you, you're fetching back by a car instead of by, um, by block. So it's going to give you in general, more of like a graph sync accelerated refetch. Um, there's a lot of other things that we can do when we expand the car file scope beyond a single transaction. So one use case for these car files is like, like let's say um, I have a um, user profile builder page that I give to the user and they're gonna you know, choose the background color and which image they want and what their you know, caption is and that kind of stuff. Um, and so that would be an HTML file with a fireproof in it and as they're working, it's saving that information to fireproof. And at the end, they'll have that um, you know, cookie-sized thing that you need to rehydrate from. So they can save that to your existing application database, your MySQL or whatever. And um, then when you go to build your static site, including all those profile pages, you can take um, you can say, hey, Fireproof, give me the car file for that entire database. So, you know, maybe it's like a thousand blocks. Um, it's everything, it's everything the user wanted on their profile, all wrapped up into one, like, content delivery network friendly package. And so then you'd have your compact database in one file, you know, in, uh, in your, um, you know, Gatsby static site build, so that when the page fetch first happens, the users are interacting with a data set that's been scoped for exactly them. Um, if there have been changes that came, you know, if the user, the composer of the data set has done work since the publish operation, you can fetch the diff and hydrate the new data uh, right there in the browser. So that's a use case for um, packing the car files uh, or packing more than one transaction in a car file is you can put the whole database together for an accelerated download. Um, one of the other things, like maybe let's go back and uh, if these encrypted blocks are the, are the neon green, um, if we have the not encrypted blocks, right, in a car file, there's other useful stuff we can do be because it's on a transaction boundary. So uh, one problem in this world of building collaborative apps, probably one of the harder problems is key management, especially for shared data. So you can do, there's lots of fancy solutions. I might even outline like one that's on the horizon um, for doing key management with shared data because I think it's neat. But what's neater is not having to do stuff. And so the way that um, the way that the uh, sync I, I distinguish sync from replication uh, in this context. Replication is taking your data from your application and putting it somewhere persistent, like Web3 storage. And sync is working with collaborators in real time on your data. And so if I want to sync with some people on a data set and fireproof, then what I would do is create a, a trusted channel like a WebRTC or something that we're all in and just blat around these car files that are in the clear. There's no reason to encrypt it because we are already, you know, as end users, encrypting our own data arrest copy of it. And we already trust the channel to be secure and who else is in the channel to belong in the channel. So we send them the data inside that channel and then they're able to encrypt it for their own persistence. Um, so just one of the ways that um, the, you know, my hypothesis starting this project, or rather 
uh, joining Protocol Labs, you know, a year and a half ago because I wanted to do this project was, I bet that when you get into it, a bunch of these moving parts are just ready to click together. I think it's database building time. And so um, that's, it turned out to be database building time. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think that's, um, that's it for the how it works section. Oh yeah, okay, so a question about the encryption key. Um, and, and actually I did, I, I said I, I, I did a teaser about maybe something a little bit more, you know, um, uh, nuanced. So uh, what I'm doing right now is the simplest thing that could possible or possibly work, which is for the entire database, there's just a fixed AES symmetric key that's used to put that um, in a, to, to make the car files. And then that means it's safe to ship the car files over the wire to somebody you don't trust. And that's essentially the only purpose of it. Um, and it punts on the key management. It means somebody's gonna have to figure out a sane thing to do with these keys. But in the absence of figuring that out, if all you do is treat it like it's part of the rehydrate cookie, um, you're still better than if everything was in the clear. So um, that's the initial scope. But uh, let's say I wanted to do instead of, oh, excuse me, instead of a, um, a sync, a live sync to live participants, if I wanted to do an encrypted exchange, then uh, what we could do, and this is with some of the new you can um, like attestation stuff that, that the team, Web3 storage team has been working on recently, um, is each one of these encrypted cars gets its own one-time key. And then in the UCAN that's associated with it, you'd say, um, you know, for each person in your group, um, you would encrypt the one-time key with their public key. And so you're only shipping the diff once, but it's encrypted, you know, securely for the participants. And you only use that one-time key one time. Um, so it's not, or rather, I haven't analyzed it to see if it's already there, but it's shaping up to be like um, the perfect forward secrecy stuff that you get from uh, open secure messaging and uh, you know those types of protocols. So it would allow, I think, with a little bit of thought for us to build that level of security into the messaging system on top of it. So yeah, I'll hop back into this. I've got, um, just a couple of example use cases. Uh, the big one I mentioned already was add data to any page. And so the um, rehydration cookie, as I called it, is just something that you can put in local storage. Fireproof does this for you by default. You don't have to worry about it. But uh, that's all it is, is putting that somewhere so that when you rehydrate the page, it gets to the right state. Um, and so, you know, depending on your replication settings, then whether or not that uh, fireproof ever existed on that node or not, it'll be able to fetch down the data and interact with it. So use cases where putting data into any page is valuable. Something like a Salesforce app or like any other enterprise app where you've built some line of business thing and it's going to be super expensive to change, but you just need to add a couple more fields or, you know, bring in another widget or do just like some, some lightweight stuff on top of an existing line of business app is there's just so much institutional inertia sometimes to making changes uh, through the back end, but if you can make those changes all on the front end and have the data um, you know, kind of guarantees and security and um, integrity that Fireproof offers, then why would you do it on the back end? So uh, definitely a lot of opportunity in those kind of upgrading those line of business apps. Anytime you want to do you know, structured local data on the browser, so A-B testing, or bringing up um, features from behind feature flags for users, um, makes a lot of sense also. Um, customizable widgets, and then, um, you know, kind of going one deeper, like you've got a whole enterprise line of business set of apps for your users, and now you wanna add some kind of auditing layer where um, you just wanna take a secondary copy of the interactions and put them somewhere else, because the original apps are you know, crufty and you don't even know what they're doing. So you <laughs> want to do that and figure out what's going on with the original apps. Um, but really any of that kind of injectable logic. Um, and then outside of, you know, these use cases where it's allowing you to do something maybe you couldn't do before and so you can upgrade apps you couldn't upgrade before. Um, there's also just a ton of let's build something and use the right tool for the job 
that these kind of data structures offer. Um, a huge one, I mean, we talked a lot about like sidechain safety and how you can link to Merkle proofs from blockchains, but provenance tracking, which is, you know, popularized, I guess, by NFTs, but if you take those NFT data structures and you use them on the outputs from AI models, and not just generated images, but text and everything, then it allows you to get a la layer of accountability for AI that's missing right now. Um, and not just accountability, but acceleration, because if you know that it's, um, you know, if you set, set your temperature to zero, so you have a deterministic result, then you can keep a rainbow table of uh, this model, this prompt, this output, and then you don't have to re-prompt all the time. So. AI models are just an expensive version of any kind of data science workload, but if you've ever worked with data scientists, you'll see that they often rerun the whole notebook even though only some of the data has changed, and that's fine. You're not gonna tell them not to do that, but it sure would be nice if that rerun was instant and free. So any kind of memoization makes a lot of sense, not just with Fireproof, but with any of these content address databases. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the other really interesting one, when the network is the database, is edge creation of IoT data. So like one of the use cases I explain to my kids is, what about the, um, you know, the point of sale at all the Burgerville drive-throughs, right? So they have um, all kinds of analytics that they're keeping about like which products are selling, which time of day and whatnot. Um, why not put that all locally and then use the, the database as the network to push the predicates down to the edge devices and get the trends and stuff reported back. Uh, people are using Couchbase Mobile for that on you know, wind turbines and stuff and uh, content address databases are a better fit. So um, uh, the last one that's good for the people in this room and something I wanna talk about with you know, the other database creators here is like how we can do some of the mix and match. Uh, so let's say you um, laid down like a 32 gigabyte file coin slab and in the cold data you'd already pre-indexed it and you know some kind of Merkle tree, it doesn't have to be a Prowly tree, I don't know. Um, then uh, put a fireproof UI on top of that cold data, let people you know remix, reorder the playlist, whatever, pick their favorite media, tag things, and then save that back to warm storage that doesn't have to duplicate any of the stuff that was in cold storage. So there's a lot of um, ability to take cold data, archive data, and Filecoin and um, work with it just like it's fast without having any, um, you know, without having to do copies. And that's that's going to be the same for all of these databases. But I think Fireproof especially because it's uh, you know runs locally in the browser. Um, so yeah. Um, it's got all the attributes that we like. Um, one of my favorites is fork by default. I think that's gonna help end users understand um, you know, some of the value of owning their own data. And uh, um, the other fun part, so I started this project in like February and it's basically been like you know, 14 hour days hacking out. Um, it's Cause I wanna make something you know, that uh, could be the most commercial database in the IPFS community. So if y'all uh, like these attributes and you wanna um, you know, join, then what you get for joining is uh, the database dashboard, which is open source, you could run your own, but it's all integrated. Um, and then you get uh, inside of, you know, kind of like the private um, uh, forums and whatnot. So it's a dollar a month, and that pays for your first dollar of meter. Um, and I made a European price just for this conference. Um, but yeah, uh, the fun part about that is that the dollar a month gets you membership into the forums where you know people are asking questions and doing open source contributions and whatnot. Um, but it also, uh, although I don't have any metered services activated yet, um, when the meter starts to run, you know, the first the first dollars paid. Um, so that allows you to experiment with apps and probably most apps, like experimental size apps are gonna run for less than a dollar a month. So uh, it gets you in the door and, and lets you have fun. Uh, so thanks a ton. Uh, super excited to have a bunch of fireproof users. 
Uh, very cool. Um, <laughs> the uh, the actual like payloads, the the diffs that go into the Merkle clocks. Uh, would you say like you're you're kind of like a you're making a CRDT structure that's basically like a CRDT of the Prolly tree because the diffs of the Prolly tree are like the deltas that go into the Merkle clock. You could derive those diffs. All the data is there for it, but um, it's more like the, the other use case Aaron talked about, where you just put a CID in, and you know. So the thing that's in the clock is just hanging the whole next Merkle tree hmm. off of there. Uh, so I don't do any diffing operations when I'm running. The closest thing to um, like a diff resolution is that when you come to do a read, um, any writes that haven't been processed yet that are, that are in. Uh, what we're going to do is, you know, those writes might be sitting in parallel uh, next to each other, I guess, and so merge all those together until you have one root, and then you read off of that, uh, and that's when we would do the conflict detection and stuff. Awesome. And uh, and you said during the the last talk during one of your questions that uh, it's like JSON based. Uh, yeah. So when you make an update, when I do like you know document dot update or whatever, like what is it? Is a is it a patch similar to what Aaron was talking about ceramic? Is it some other structure that's being like encoded? It's a super good question. No, it's like, um, it's just the entire a, thing. A, a big old JSON stringify, it doesn't care. For every update? What's that? For every update? Yeah, if you, um, I mean, this is the same, uh, in, in Apache CouchDB and CouchBase, yeah. I went through this and decided not to patch. Like it's just, it's not, that's not where the problem lives. Um, it might be that I could get a little bit more compact with some of that on the browser. So it might be worth doing optimizations. It also hasn't really been optimization time yet. But the thing that NoSQL in general optimizes for is making it so the thing that's at the end of the git or the put is already got all the data locality done, right? So if you start fracturing that, then you lose some of that benefit. All right, makes sense. Yeah, so what uh, what's in the database is um, each document lives underneath an ID. and so you look those, they, they live in the poly tree under the ID, and then um, anything that's indexed lives in the index tree under its index key. Uh, anytime you do a document update, so uh, uh, Apache CouchDB used uh, multi-version concurrency control with um, like optimistic concurrency token that was required, and that's a really good way to just have all your users use Mongo instead. So what we did uh, in Fireproof was make the concurrency control token optional. And that means that your update is gonna be uncontrolled. You're just gonna update the, the last right wins. Um, but if you want to, and you put that optional MVCC token into your update, then it'll error on you if somebody else has messed with the document since then. Um, yeah, is there a rap video to go with this launch? <laughs> This is um, super, that, that's, that's definitely apropos. Um, oh, how does it go? Um, uh, uh, goes, um, bacon, uh, lettuce, bacon, lettuce, avocado, and tomato. You don't need servers when you blast your data. With this JavaScript code in your browser, your users get rowdy, your app gets louder. When you, <laughs> when you got data, blat. When you wanna do data, blat. That was back from when I was calling it blat. I think it's better calling it fireproof. Um, that, that wasn't actually supposed to be a question, but I appreciate the answer. Um, I use CouchDB. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about um, replication and conflicts, and in this case, calling it sync. Um, but there's cases where you need to push that up into the application layer. And there's other cases where if you push it up into the application layer, it's unknowable. And so, you know, what do we do in those cases? Um, we had an app on CouchDB that was for cable plant documentation. And if we had a conflict, the answer was you send a technician back out into the head end and see where that cable actually went. Um, so I think comparing it with Git probably isn't a good idea in general because normally we know what to do in Git or can figure it out eventually, um, but the application user may not. So are there strategies for avoiding that, um, you know, not having the lock obviously is, is one way of doing it, um, going to last right. 
might have worked in CouchDB because they would have had documentation and eventually known that it was wrong. But how do we avoid getting there to begin with? That's a super good question. I mean, I think maybe what Aaron was saying in the first talk about having tunable uh, you know, choices for when you need that strong consistency. So uh, in the you know, real world use case you talked about, like imagining writing that app on Couch, I could see how like everything's great and then like wouldn't it be cool if then you had like a barrier you could throw, right? Before you let, before you rolled truck back away or something, you know? Um, and so uh, we don't have any notion of that in Fireproof, but um, the, you know, aside from having that transaction boundary, which we could maybe throw additional guarantees on in the future. Um, but I think maybe uh, the, more power is going to come out of tools for inspecting the diffs and understanding the context of conflicts. I mean, on the assumption that as the database vendor, I can't make people not write conflicts, then the best thing I can do is make it easier for them when that happens. And so in Couch, we would never throw any data away, but it wasn't like super well documented what to do in those contexts. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that there's anything inherently better or fixed about the current situation, but I do think because of the way that the trees interact and everything being immutable, you're way more likely to be able to um, kind of recreate that context. Um, even if maybe you have to do the work to stand, you know, uh, so Fireproof has a snapshot feature. You can give it a historical clock and it'll run from back then. Um, so you could go ask, you know, when you, when you notice the conflict, you could go query the whole database at a snapshot of when that conflict occurred and give you some opportunity to do some auto merging. For the, uh, for the transactions, are you using a car V1 or a V2? Uh, V2, I think. All right. Do you use like the index stuff at all at the tail end? Um, I don't need to yet, but the encryption will. So like I, the encrypted blocks do, I guess, but I, I have a, um, clear index in my index DB of from um, basically from clear CID to encrypted car file. Okay. Um, so you can use those car indexes to rebuild. You have to decrypt it first. Like the, basically you have some, an index that tells you what the encrypted blocks are and then you have to use that to rehydrate the CID set of the decrypted blocks. So the, the blocks and the, the like looking at the perspective from the Merkle clock, uh, would you say like the head is like the encrypted block, or is the head the like the CID of the encrypted oh, block? Oh yeah, or no, the it's it, of the plain text block. It's strictly the plain text stuff. So like everything that is semantic about the database lives above that line, right? And the encryption is just part of the storage engine. So um, you know that's why it makes sense to exchange the clear blocks when you're in a trusted work group. So then, like if you receive an encrypted block, it's not until after you decrypt it and process it, do you know if it's actually like a valid block in this context? Yeah, totally. Yeah, the encryption is um, is opaque from the outside. Okay, yeah. Which means you need to keep a secondary manifest of the car files you need and all that. All right, um, if there's no more questions, uh, y'all should, we should all start calling ourselves cloudless. I, I've been market testing it, it works. Um, <laughs>